Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for healthy our Healthy 100 web chat. We're taking on a topic that can impact more than 60 million Americans every month, and that's heartburn. And we've got a great doctor to talk to you about everything from acid reflux to GERD, how to treat it. Today we've got Dr. James Butch Rosser in. He's a general surgeon at Florida Hospital Celebration Health. He's here to take your questions, so we need you to type those in. We're going to try and get to those live here in the next 20 minutes. The doctor is in, so let's get started. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rosser, for joining us. Hi, Jennifer. It's great to be with you again. Fantastic. This is a big issue. We're going to start with the basics on heartburn. Uh, a lot of terms getting thrown around, heartburn, acid reflux, GERD. Are they the same thing or are there subtle differences between these terms that we're talking about? Uh, it, it's still part of the same family. You, you, the, the difference is the different faces of GERD. You have the more common face of uh, GERD or acid reflux where you have bloating, nausea, sometimes you have uh, 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 vomiting. Mm. But the big thing is that burning sensation in the back of your, your breastplate right here. That's what we really know as the common face. But then there's another face, one that is not so common. And that's where you have raspy voice, hoarseness, post-nasal uh, drip, a lot of mucus in your mouth. And, and really, that is, that is what we call the, the category of silent refluxers. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that suffer in silence and are exposed to a deadly disease. So you make so much sense because we all know the, the burning chest pain. That, that's something we all, that's heartburn, that's yeah. reflux. We can all identify that, but those yeah. silent ones, that's, that's, that's a dangerous thing. Right, and I tell you what, uh, up to 40% of the people who have chronic uh, voice issues uh, uh, are because uh, they're refluxers. Uh, and the ENT doctor sees a lot of these folks, uh, folk with chronic pneumonia, the internal medicine doctors see a lot of these people and they're suffering in si silence, but they're on a journey to a potential bad outcome. Okay, we've already got some questions coming in. Mm -hmm. Let's start mm -hmm. with one of them because it mentions pneumonia as you talked about. Mm -hmm. The first one is GERD and pneumonia. How do you help your child with that? And that's a whole other thing. We think of heartburn and things, not necessarily in babies, but it does happen. Oh, look, this is a significant issue in uh, uh, children because it can cut out their life before it gets started. Mm. And what happens is that they have this reflux at an early age. When they lie down at night, they subsequently will have the fluid in their stomach to come right back into their lungs. And you can all, all, oftentimes hear them crying and you don't know what's wrong and they could have reflux. Now, there's some things, of course, you can do to help. Look for those silent symptoms. You know, the baby has a hoarse cry all the time. Really intoler uh, just not tolerating the formula very well. Burping with formula coming right in the mouth. That is, that, that is a sign that maybe the child may have reflux. And one of those things that you can do where there's an operation that can help the child if it's that bad. But the other things you can do, you can make sure the child sits up, at, up is propped up at night, the head is propped up at night. Mm -hmm. Also, don't feed them so late at night, and therefore they don't have a full stomach. And when they lay down, of course, what happens? The gastric contents in the stomach come back into the lungs. Mm -hmm. So really, if you know your child has reflux, there are some things that you can do to avoid that. Watch when they eat. Don't let them eat so, uh, so late. Small meals and when they sleep at night, prop their, their heads up. But really a child, it is absolutely a priority to get them to a doctor to become aware of what the true diagnosis is. Yeah, it's important. I know I've dealt with that with my daughter oh, yeah, too. Right. We had to put some bricks underneath the crib to get it height, so exactly. the reflux and all of that. So definitely dealing with that. Um, and then another question that came in, can GERD be the cause of no, my nose bleeding, or, or sorry, nose being stuffy in the morning? Uh -oh. So stuffiness in the morning, is that one of those silent symptoms? Oh yeah, and post-nasal drip. And uh, it, these are some of the, uh, the, the less common faces of, of, of reflux disease, uh, upper reflux disease. It, in other words, the fluid's coming all the way back up into your throat, into the nasal passages. For that person, if someone actually looked in to look at their sinuses or looked at their vocal cords, they would see it beefy red. I mean, there are obvious signs that your doctor can pick up and get you on your way to being properly treated. 
Fantastic. Um, this is a problem, and not surprising that we already had some questions come in so early on. It affects so many people. I know right. you had some some uh, ways to give us a little bit of context. Um, you know, we talked about sixty more than sixty million Americans are monthly having heartburn symptoms, but I know you have some amazing numbers too that can have some um, impact. You know, it's not just the heartburn; it can lead to dangerous things. Well, and that's why we have to let people know, Jennifer. Uh, that this is a widespread problem. Um, when you look at the data, really it's 60 to 120 million people who, who would have heartburn at least one month. Then there's 20 percent that will have heartburn one week, uh, at least once a week, and then there are three to seven percent that have it every single day. Now, the patients that have it every single day, they have a different hybrid of the disease. Yeah. This is an absolute serious disease that needs to be diagnosed appropriately and treated appropriately. Now you may say, well, how does that translate into real numbers? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, imagine this. If we had 60 airplane crashes, you know, every year mm -hmm. with 250 people on board, that's how many would die from esophageal cancer that they actually got from having reflux for, through the years. Wow. The connection between reflux and the fastest growing cancer in America, esophageal cancer, is real and you must be aware. One in 33 people are walking around uh, with this problem in the United States of America. So we must become aware so we can intervene er early. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you were talking about the idea that it's more than just the moment of discomfort. It's yes. more than just the symptoms. Yes. You're leading to a bigger problem. A lot of people are treating the symptoms, the heartburn, all of the sinus issues with medications. Uh, and, uh, and they're uh, widely, widely used medications. Talk about some of those. Well, th th to be honest with you, they're so widely used that about uh, 13 to 18 billion dollars were spent uh, last year on these drugs. And in fact, Jennifer, 20% of the primary care visits in the United States of America are for heartburn, mm -hmm. okay? And that, that's up 46%. This is a, a growing problem that really uh, we're making several mistakes with. Patients are not getting properly evaluated. They don't know the signs and symptoms. Then when they go to, doctor, the, to the doctor or they treat themselves, they're inadequately treated by either taking a dose of medicine too low or not taking the medicine at the right time. Oh. So guess what, it's just like you said, you think your symptoms are gone, but the scourge is still there, eating away at your esophagus, setting you up for esophageal cancer. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I'm so glad to be here today to, to, to kind of give people a straight scoop on this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have another question and I wanna get to that really quickly here. Um, you know one question here i've been on an over-the-counter drug for years mm. nothing works right. do i need to go to surgery and we were just talking about the drugs are you know we can talk about the surgery piece we're going to get to that in just a second but mm -hmm. also these drugs taken over a long period of time many people are under the false assumption that you can take these drugs for a long period of time i know you have an opinion about that well in fact uh, your family doctor and internal medicine doctors say it's the most miracle it's, it's the biggest miracle drug of all time mm -hmm. but to answer your uh, listeners first question they've been treating themselves over the counter you really are making the mistake that i talked about you are being you are under treating yourself with the wrong strength medication mm. you may also be taking the medication at the wrong time because that could be specific. But one thing I would have to say to that person is, um, you know, give up your medical license, you know, that you <laughs> never had, yeah. and go see a doctor. And I know it's fear, because mm -hmm. all of us have fear when we, when we know we have something wrong. But overcome that fear, because you don't have to suffer like this anymore, and you don't have to fall victim of esophageal cancer like my uncle. I had the unfortunate uh, uh, privilege, uh, Jennifer, of uh, being a medical student, taking care of my uncle, uncle dying mm -hmm. uh, with esophageal cancer in the VA, and I'll never forget that. Yeah, it makes an impression. Yes, so does. the over-the-counter drugs, not something you want to go long term. Um, you know, are, are they safe to go in and get that temporary relief? And, and when should mm -hmm. people know that, okay, this is a temporary thing, or this is something that I'm dealing with too much? The key is temporary. Mm -hmm. if, if you're if you're having heartburn and you're, you're at, you know, 
after Thanksgiving, you had a bad case of heartburn. Yeah. Okay, and that happens, you know, every now and then, every half a year, you know, like when you have pecan pie or your grandmother's uh, uh -huh. uh, dressing. That's okay. Yeah. But put it as a temporary stopgap. If you're having this more, say, every week, mm -hmm. okay, uh, that's a problem. Yeah. Temporarily get the medicine over the counter, but then go straight to the doctor because after viewing this webcast, you know better. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You're, no excuses anymore. No excuses. That's it. And it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's take a look and see what other questions. All right. Um, we've got another one about a child using Zantac when she wakes up and when she goes to sleep. Is that sufficient? And I think that's probably coming from your, your context about medication. Right, right, exactly. And, and the thing I would say right now is check with your pediatrician. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm an adult. Uh, a physician and even though I used to do a pediatric surgery also but that I would seek uh, the advice of your doctor bring that up I mean, what you do with your doctors is, is this if you're concerned about that you it's okay to ask mm -hmm. especially if you read up doctors love informed patients I know you think that they may get a little upset but come and say doctor I heard on this webcast that taking the medicines at pro different times could have an impact on my child, what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. That is a non-threatening way to bring up that significant problem. And what I want her to do, that's an important one because an adjustment in the type of medication and the time she takes her medication may be absolutely critical for the treatment of her child. Yeah, yeah, and, and I certainly wouldn't give anybody medical advice, but I know from my personal yeah. experience with my infant daughter, mm -hmm. it was give it right before bedtime. That's and right. that was the prescription that we exactly. got from the physician. So something to consider. Yeah. Um, okay, let's talk a little about the, the symptoms. You said once a month, not something to bring up too cause, big of a cause for concern. The once a week, time to go to the doctor. What do you? Th what are the options for people? I mean, obviously they need to get evaluated by their physician. But are we saying if you've got this once a week that you're going to be a candidate for surgery? Or, oh no, or, no. So kind of, kind of ease people's minds a little bit yeah. about what happens is that this going once a week. Well, even though I'm a surgeon, mm -hmm. okay, I rejoice when people don't have to have an operation because right. I have so many who don't have a choice. Uh, but what I want to do is just give you some evidence-based medicine as to how, um, give you context on how we should approach this. Mm -hmm. First of all, if you go and get properly diagnosed and you have GERD and you put on the proper medicines, taking them at the proper time for the proper length of time, 45% of you won't have a problem anymore. That's good news. And that's very good news. But see, if you don't treat yourself properly, then you're going to have a chronic issue. Now, 20% mm -hmm. of those folks would still have an issue. Mm -hmm. And if you still have an issue, after you're properly treated and you've gone through the proper workup, then that's when we have to start evaluating you uh, for surgery. For surgery, uh, surgery is really reserved to folk who are going to have, who have the disease so bad and the door between the esophagus in the stomach is so weak that it needs help. Mm -hmm. And that's a small percentage of the total population, but the total population is 60 to 120 million. Yeah. So that means there's a lot of people going without surgery who need surgery mm -hmm. and don't know it. Fantastic. Let's go um, take a look at another question that we've got. Um, this one going on pneumonia caused by reflux. Oh, yeah. Is it automatic as reflux during the night equals pneumonia or does this happen over time, meaning weeks and months? Well, it can happen within one episode of reflux that goes down into your lungs. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, um, the stomach contents are really caustic. They are very aggressive. So if they get into the lung tissue, it's going to be impactful and it's going to show up right away. I have another question for you. Yeah. The question I'd like to ask them, how long have you been on these antacid medica medications? Because there's an increased incidence of pneumonia when you're taking these medications. Wow. See, that's the other part of the medications people don't realize. Uh, we spent $13, $18 billion on these medications, and the problem is people are trying to take them long term, and they're getting complications. One of the complications is community acquired pneumonia. Uh. So once again, you know, the internet's great, there's great information. You have talking heads like me that sit up here and give you some insight, but the bottom line, you know something's wrong, go and get professional help yeah. to help you figure it out. 
Well, I can't let you get out of here without talking about surgery, since yeah. that is your area yeah. of expertise. I know you have some new technology that uh, is just coming to the marketplace mm -hmm. here in our community, as well as in other parts of the United States. Talk to me a little bit about, you brought a little model here. Tell me a little bit about some of the latest surgical techniques that can make it easier on people with this, that are the surgical candidates. Well, here, well, here it is. Um, I want to just, I'm going to take you to medical school Good, for a moment. Good, please and do, I'm school teach me. Our, teach our groups, uh, you know, about some anatomy. This is a cutaway of your, your stomach, and now the front part of your stomach's removed. Here's the stomach down here. Up here is your food tube, where the food passes into the stomach. Right here, right here is the door between your food tube and your stomach. This door is really one of the most brilliant mechanisms God ever thought up. Mm -hmm. It senses when the pressure in here is too much or you're too full, it gets tighter. When the pressure is lower, it relaxes. It also senses when the food comes down, oh, I got food coming, I'm going to let it through. Also, it senses when acid comes up, I got acid coming, oh, no, no, no. Well, sometimes when God put uh, in the place, it doesn't work right all the time. You get reflux, really, for the majority of the time because this door is inappropriately relaxing. Mm -hmm. So, what can you do? Well, you can actually go in, take this part of your stomach and wrap it around, and just like you have that turtleneck on, mm -hmm. you put a little collar around that area to reinforce that door, mm -hmm. and it gets stronger. But yet, it still can allow you to swallow. That's called a Nissen fundoplication, great operation. Mm -hmm. But you know the problem with that operation? Mm -hmm. It is an operation that takes a lot of experience and expertise that everybody doesn't have. Mm -hmm. If you have an expert doing it, great long-term result. Good. And that's contrary to the belief of this, uh, people that the operation don't work. And all you family practitioners, internal medicines out there, uh, 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 professionals who are saying that, really look at your literature, that is not the case. But it's a good thing, but also I mentioned the shortcomings. Yeah. Now, we, now we have a little technology yeah. that's now coming in place. It actually is similar to the way my bracelet acts here with these little beads, except we have these magnets. Mm -hmm. And what happens as the food comes down, the magnet, if you could help me yep, hold here. this. You want me to hold this? Yeah. yeah. I want to just show, show the group. Uh, the look Lynx at these Reflux magnets. And we've been using magnet technology. And this Restore is called the, the Lynx uh, Reflux System. And the link system lasts for life. And here we are with the magnets, and we go around and put it around that door. We make that collar, and well, I say, oh, look at this. Now, what happens when the food comes down? It expands, okay? When the acid tries to come up, it, it, it basically clamps down. Yeah. This is just like what God <laughs> gave you yeah. in the beginning. And Jen, we're excited about this because we can put this in more hands of surgeons mm -hmm. and people can have a better result. And, and that's why they call it the Links for Life system. Very cool. And so these are just like magnets, yes, if you they're will. Yes, so they're little earth magnets. Uh -huh. They're attracted to each other. They're attracted to each other. And, and just like this bracelet, mm -hmm. see how it stretches yeah. when my big paw goes in like that? <laughs> yeah. This is exactly the way this works. And I love this because here's a, in, an invention uh, in innovation with this bracelet that leads to an invention mm -hmm. with the magnets and it's really cool so now you don't have to destroy all the anatomy uh, if this doesn't work uh, you can come back and still do the original operation but at least Jennifer this is a nice stopgap that give people options for care and it, it is less destructive cool mm -hmm. very cool and yes. I know you're gonna be starting to use this here pretty soon oh yeah we're one of the first uh, celebration yeah it's celebration one of the first hospitals in the country to be approved to do this, uh, there's only uh, 19 more hospitals that are doing it. Fantastic. Yeah. We got lots of questions. Let's oh, yeah. See if let's we can knock some. a couple of these out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, got a question from Laura. Will having a hernia cause GERD and reflux? Hernia, is there some relationship there? Oh, I love it. And, and who is that? Laura? Uh, Laura. Well, hey, mm -hmm. hey, Laura. Let me tell you this. Hi, it, the, the hernia you're talking about is the hiatal hernia. Mm -hmm. The hiatal hernia can be associated with reflux, but they're not necessarily connected together. You can have a hernia and no reflux. And you can have reflux with no hernia. Okay. So I want you to know the hiatal hernia, if you have a problem with that, 
uh, yes, it could go with reflux, uh, especially if they get to be a certain size, mm -hmm. size, but it's not automatic. But I'm glad you knew that, Laura. And keep reading, Good girl. Connection. Keep reading. Yeah. Good connection. All right. And then we've got a question here from Anna. I want to get to that too. What mm -hmm. tests should I have done to diagnose a potential problem? Oh, so when I, you go in the doctor, what do you need to ask for? Great, great question. The first thing with the common symptoms, what's going to happen is that you want to go in and after you get evaluated, they're going to want to do um, an endoscopy. They want to give you a little medicine, put your la-la land, and look down. Mm -hmm. See, the reflux can run, but it can't hide. They will do biopsies on your stomach, biopsies on your esophagus, look at it under the microscope, and they can tell you if you're having this acid eating the lining of your food tube. And it can see if you have the first signs of the possibility of developing esophageal cancers called Barrett's esophagus. Mm -hmm. You want to know that early. So that's what they're going to do first. Now, if they endoscopy, the endoscopy first, first. first. Okay. Endos not X-rays. Before it was thought X-rays were. We only use X-rays rarely now to make some uh, tactical decisions about surgery. The next thing, if things are a little skittish, what they'll do as far as evidence is concerned, they say, well, we're not quite sure. Let's study how much acid actually comes up in 24 hours, mm -hmm. and then they will use something called a Bravo capsule or they'll put a, 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 a catheter down your nose for 24 hours. Well, I'm glad we got the Bravo capsule because all you have to do is that's placed and it can transmit the data back and you don't have to walk around with this thing hanging from your nose all the time. Mm -hmm. If I were you, I'd ask the doctor if I could have the Bravo capsule. Yeah. Now, say for instance, we still need more information or they need more information for surgery. Mm -hmm. They want to know about your pumping power of your food tube and how strong is that door? Now that's called esophageal manometry, and they can let you know exactly what's going on there. Because, Jennifer, there's some other problems that can mimic reflux, and you don't want to make uh, a costly mistake mm -hmm. of misdiagnosis. Yeah. And then, X, as I said before, the x-rays come rarely when I have to make a decision with some special situations. Okay. But don't let anybody tell you you have reflux on an x-ray. And if your doctor is sending you, sending you to an x-ray first, say, mm -hmm. you say, well, doc, you really think we ought to do that? Yeah. You know, and then see what he or she says. Time to ask some questions, maybe yeah. second opinion. Absolutely. Okay, good deal. Let's look at see if we've got any couple more here. Um, I know we had one, the pneumonia on reflux, yes. and I'm looking here. Um, I think this is a, a follow-up to that one um, about that infant. She's been on Zantac since she was born two mm -hmm. years ago, mm -hmm. got pneumonia last December, but ever since she's had sign of pneumonia caused by reflux again. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously this is something that needs some attention, it sounds well, like. Well, I mean, what I'm hearing is a, an aggressive, continuing problem that has not responded to the medication. I really think it's time now that the child needs to be really reevaluated, uh, and um, doctors may make um, a decision that a surgical option is for her. Now, the link system, you know, ha has not been tried in children, so right. it would not be appropriate for children. But the Nissen fundal plication, where we take and make that collar of stomach around that uh, valve, that is tried and true. Mm -hmm. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. Dr. Rosser, we sure appreciate all the time that you've oh, given us pleasure. today. Um, that's all the time that we're going to have for our Healthy 100 chat. Of course, thanking Dr. Um, James Butch Rosser for his expertise on GERD and acid reflux. And if you'd like to schedule an appointment with Dr. Rosser, you can do that as well. You can call 407-303-DOCS and they will make sure that you get in touch with him there. Um, and of course, uh, you like this web chat? Do you like the format? What, who, what are we going to talk about next time? Well, you can find out more about upcoming web chats by uh, following Florida Hospital on Twitter or also liking us on Facebook. But I can give you a little preview. On January 8th, around 2 o'clock, we're going to be talking health and wellness and those dreaded New Year's resolutions that we all try to make after the first of the year. Dr. Ross is <laughs> laughing over here. Uh, we're going to have an inspirational Central Florida executive that's going to be here joining us. There's lots of information on him already on our social media sites. He's battled cancer. He's done mountain climbing. Great guy to talk about inspiration when it comes to changing your life for the healthier. So again, thank you so much for watching and participating in Florida Hospital's Healthy 100 web chat. I'm Jennifer Roberts, and we hope you're going to join us again.